Hello, everyone. It's wonderful to see you all. This is great. We're going to take a snapshot of everybody here. We're going to take a screenshot here of everybody on the line, as many as we can fit on a couple of pages. I'm Jennifer Jones. It's so nice to see you. I'm the director of the Economics Career Office, and we're really excited today to be hosting our Public Policy Careers Program uh, with alumni Rushi Kao, uh, Elena Ree, and Professor Bill Shob. Uh, Professor Shob has actually moderated this very panel before, but now I've asked him to sit in as a panelist. So. We're really in for a treat here today. Thank you, thank you um, everyone for joining us as panelists for taking your time to do that. Uh, it's because of you, you being here, that we are able to build connections between the department and our majors and the world of work. Um, I'm also grateful for our outstanding eco student staff this year, one of whom is worked on this program, Chloe Leo. You will have received information for her, which is how you ended up being here. There she is. Uh, we also have uh, Flora came on the line. She also is working with the ECO and she'll be in touch about other programs as the year moves on. Um, the ECO was established in 2013. It was the brainchild of some of our professors, Ken Elzinga, Charlie Holt, Ed Burton, John Pepper, and Lee Coppock. And it was really important to them to have career services in Monroe Hall. Right now, of course, we are in a virtual world and I'm in Belmont and Charlottesville. But the idea overall is to have, uh, have a team in the department to work specifically with our majors. And now we also um, offer services to prospective majors as well as time allows. Um, this is the, the uh, oh, I, I do wanna say that it was the ECO is a brainchild of our faculty, but it was the support of our alumni, their generosity that allowed us to actually fund the office. Um, when we're back in Monroe Hall, you can check outside Monroe 120. There is a plaque with the names of the alumni who have supported the office. And many of those alumni are actually in positions to recruit and hire our students for internships and jobs. So check out that plaque next time you have a chance. Um, this is the ECO's first career panel this year. Uh, we, we hope that you'll join us for others. We are planning a series of virtual site visits to think tanks or research institutes in DC and New York City later this semester. So be on the lookout for those programs as we send emails to you. And if international development is what you're interested in, be on the lookout for emails about Global Development Career Day. That's also at the end of October. Okay, great. So let me tell you a little bit more about what we're going to be doing today. We're going to start with a brief overview of public policy. Uh, Bill will be talking, uh, sharing that information with us. And then each panelist will introduce themselves. I'll ask a few questions and may follow up with some of our panelists for more information about what they share. And then we're going to open up the session for Q&A to all of you. Um, unlike our eco individual workshops, I'm going to ask you to turn your video off during the uh, panel presentation. You don't have to go away yet, but it, in, in just a minute when the panel starts, that allows us to keep our panelists front and center for all of you. Then when we start the Q&A, we want you to come back on so you can ask the questions yourself. You'll unmute yourselves, ask your questions, or you can send your questions in the chat. So I'll come back to that so you don't need to worry about that. I'll give those um, instructions again. Um, and then after the Q&A, we'll have some office hours. We do have some more slots with uh, both Elena and Rushi. So um, with that, um, our guests today share in common degrees in economics. They have worked with different organizations, have had different career trajectories, and are in different stages of their careers. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Bill, if you kick us off, please share with us um, a, an overview of what public policy is, and then please share with us what your background is, your major, your degrees, how you got started in the field, and where you are now. Thank you so much. Okay, I hope you'll remind me about all those questions I'm supposed to yep. answer after I, uh, define, after I define public policy. <laughs> Um, all right, so um, I'm just, you are all, or most of you are economics majors. You've had your uh, introductory class in micro and macro. And so you know that in economics, we generally emphasize the importance of uh, markets and allocating resources. And we like to depend on them for doing that because they use voluntary exchange for allocating resources, and that's really cool. Uh, and it has really good properties. 
But we also understand that there are times when we can't depend on volunteer exchange to move resources around. And um, the reason for that is that something about uh, the, the dependence on voluntary exchange breaks down. And uh, that opens us up for needing to cooperate outside of voluntary exchange, outside of markets, to figure out why we're having a problem and what we might do about it. And so public policy is the study of that process, the study of figuring out why things aren't working out in a way that, that seems efficient and effective. So the first thing we have to do is understand the structure of the problem. And economics is one of our key tools for understanding what's wrong. Why aren't we getting outcomes that we think are satisfactory? And once we have, a, in, in order to do something about the problem, the first thing you have to do is understand the structure of why things aren't working out. So, so question number one, why aren't we getting good results from our, uh, from our preferred mechanism for allocating resources through voluntary exchange? Uh, and then once we have a sense for why we're getting outcomes that we aren't happy with, then we can start think, thinking about designing possible mechanisms for resolving that. And of course, what we want is we want mechanisms that maximize personal freedom, that maximize, uh, that, that minimize the cost of accomplishing the goals we're trying to accomplish, and that are fair and, um, and treat people in an equitable, equitable manner. So these are all sort of constraints we put on ourselves. We want an efficient policy. We want a policy that's not too intrusive on people's lives. We want policies that accomplish the goal that we're setting out to accomplish in, a, in an efficient way, a cost-effective way. So we, we have the step of designing, uh, of understanding why we have a problem, designing solutions, and you can see the economics there too. And then the last stage is in, in going back and testing the effectiveness. We put policies in place. We need to always be going back and looking at the data. We need to ask ourselves, how have policies we've put in place before worked? Have they worked the way we thought? If not, why not? If so, are there improvements we can make? And so the policy process is about identifying, designing, and testing and uh, evaluating uh, uh, policy approaches for solving uh, resource allocations problem when, when markets can't do it for us. Okay, terrific. Thank you for that. Um, and it is clear that you are coming at this from the economics perspective. I understand that's not your undergraduate degree, but is one of your advanced degrees. Can you talk to us a little bit about your, you know, earlier career decision making and the degrees that you hold and how that's kind of informed where you are at now? Sure, sure. Um, I, took, I took a roundabout way uh, to find out that I was an economist. Um, I was a political science major in college because I always knew I had to be a lawyer. And I don't know why I knew that, but I always knew it. And so in college, I was a political science major because at the time, everyone advised you, if you want to go to law school, study political science. So that's what I did. And I went ahead and got my law degree. Uh, I was interested in, an, I'm an environmental economist, uh, and I was interested in environmental issues back then, and I wanted to study in particular environmental law. So I did that, got my degree, went to work for a national environmental organization, the Natural Resources Defense Council, as an environmental lawyer. And I quickly began to realize that there were all these important economics questions that would come up in all the cases we were addressing. And we didn't have any economists to help us figure those things out. And so uh, I did have a little econ as an undergraduate and I was thinking, gee, there has to be something in economics for us. So I'm gonna go back and study some economics so I can be a better lawyer. And the funny thing is that the minute I got to graduate school, 
I realized that I was really an economist and I wasn't a lawyer at all at heart. And so uh, I didn't look back. I went ahead and got my PhD. Uh, I had planned on just getting a master's and going back to my uh, law work, but I loved the economics way of looking at problems and the power of economics in building solutions. I'm kind of a policy engineer. I use economics to design public policies. In particular, I study emission markets and how to make them work well. Uh, so uh, for me, um, once I got to graduate school in economics, I thought, now here's a set of tools that really appeal to me about understanding problems and designing solutions to problems. And so that's what led me finally to get my degree in economics. And since then, I've gone back and forth between teaching economics and um, working for state and federal government um, in uh, environmental economics and policy. Okay, thank you so much. That's a terrific introduction. We're going to come back and talk to you a little bit more about uh, Weldon Cooper Center and um, uh, after we have a chance to meet uh, Rishi and Elena. So uh, Elena, you, you took your economics degree in a different direction um, and went into um, a, more of a financially related program. Can you talk a little bit about your major at UVA or um, how you got started in the field and a little bit about your recent work? Sure, um, thank, thank you everybody so much for having me today. Um, so yeah, I, I studied international economics or economics with an international uh, focus and then also double majored in international relations. And um, as Bill mentioned in a similar way, I think I was, was very confident that I sort of wanted to work at the intersection of these two types of fields. I was, I was interested in public policy, um, but I think even as early as undergrad recognized that you get a lot of sort of additional understanding, but then also leverage in, in the world of public policy if you can sort of come at it from an economics perspective. Um, so after, after studying at UVA, I um, was pretty determined to work for the International Monetary Fund. Um, I have sort of a background of multilateral development finance in my family, and it was something that I just thought was the coolest job ever. Um, a lot of travel, a lot of sort of high profile engagements. Um, and a lot of exposure to all of the very different sorts of worlds um, that you can encounter within within macroeconomics. Um, so, you know, spent a couple of months after graduation um, unsuccessfully applying to organizations like the IMF and the World Bank and eventually decided that I needed a bit of a change of tact um, and ended up working within the IMF's IT department. So they have a um, a specific team that's dedicated to sort of fielding um, questions from economists and problems on the technical side, which ended up being a big boost for me when I then sort of moved on to, to the role that I wanted originally, which was as a research analyst, in the sense that, you know, I already had a bit of familiarity with the in-house tech, like technology products and um, programs that the IMF has there. So yeah, I spent, um, a little under a year working in IT and then was hired within the European department of the IMF as, a, as an RA. Um, incredible experience. Um, really can't think of a place off the top of my head that gives you access to quite such established trainings and lectures in addition to sort of your day-to-day -day work. And then beyond that, um, there are so many opportunities to engage with sort of extracurricular, maybe you would call it, um, research projects. Um, once you sort of get a handle on your day-to-day -day activities, um, after that point, sort of if you can do those within the first couple of hours of the day, then there really is a lot of scope for you to sort of sign up and volunteer for whatever additional projects you might be interested in um, and, and hopefully get published. So um, that was a big boost for me when I then decided to go on and get my graduate degree. Um, it was pretty helpful in terms of scoping out programs. Um, I think viewed pretty fav favorably within with that academia. So those were a lot of the great sort of benefits that I think I got from the IMF. Um, that being said, you know, it is a bit of a, um, it's a bubble that, that sort of IFI world, I think, especially within DC when you're sort of at headquarters, um, 
you can get into a very streamlined way of thinking. And so I was excited to go to go study um, further. I, I, I just finished um, my master's in public policy. Um, you know, I was born and raised in the DC area and I have purported to be so interested in all of these sort of international econ and policy types of issues that I felt that it would maybe be beneficial to go to school outside of the US um, to get some international experience. Um, so that was a big factor in, in choosing to leave the States. Um, and yeah, and, and now I'm back and looking for a job like I'm sure many of you are or will be soon. So spending my time right now um, after London, just at home at my parents' house in Northern Virginia and trying to figure out what the next couple of steps are for me. Thank you, thank you. Um, we are gonna come back and ask you some more questions about the IMF and projects that you've worked on. Sure. I wanna come and uh, greet Rushi. Thank you for so much for joining us. Uh, when, would you kindly share with us your background as well? Uh, I know that you and I spoke a little bit over the summer as well, and thank you so much for your connection, uh, the connection to Urban Institute, who will be participating in our think tank track oh, later. Oh, great. Sir. So thank you for sharing that news with you here. Um, can you talk to us about your you know, entrance into your, your career field, your majors, we know a little bit about that, how you got started in the field and what you're pursuing now? Yeah, I think those are great questions. And I want to say Elena had a wonderful intro uh, that clearly indicates her interest in economics and her track record and experience in the field. I think for me, if you were to look at my LinkedIn, I think you'd be really surprised to see where I took my economics degree. And full disclosure, I double majored in economics and religious studies at UVA, graduated in 2015. And those are completely different majors, right? Even though they all sit in the College of Arts and Sciences. So you can imagine the questions that I had from recruiters who are like, hmm, what is your double major? And how did it come to be? And for me, I think both those degrees gave me um, different frameworks at approaching life and where I wanted to go. But to be honest, I didn't really know where I wanted to go um, after graduation which is why I landed in operations management for a year in uh, Ohio. I was working in a, a half a million square foot warehouse and a management rotational program, and I didn't like it. So I switched, um, I pivoted a little bit. I am based in Washington, D.C., the Washington, D.C. metro area like um, Elena and I landed a job um, in digital marketing at a small um, and now huge and growing um, education technology company called to you. They're headquartered um, in Maryland, but just right outside of DC. And my career and my experience from there on forth has been in digital marketing and in marketing analytics. My most recent role was in advertising and um, analytics at the Urban Institute. So I think if I were, I think what has been incredibly helpful for me since graduating is realizing that it's okay that you're not sure of what you want to do. And I think if I was in your shoes today, um, I think that I would have a really good idea of what I want to do, but I would say be open and, and try and explore different fields if you can. So um, I'm gonna end on this point, which is that I am currently in Charlottesville. So I'm an MBA candidate at uh, the Darden School of Business at the University of Virginia. I'm a first year, um, so I just started school. Although if you can believe it, we're already in our final season for our first quarter. And I came to Darden because I wanted to expand my understanding of the field that I was working in. So the function I was doing was in um, marketing. And um, my goal eventually is to work at a large, larger tech company. So it's something that's a little bit removed from my major, but um, you know, it got me there. So uh, open to any questions about pivots and changes. Um, that's definitely something that I did not expect going into UVA is having to pivot and change so many times, but that's life. 
That's great. Thank you so much. It's incredibly reassuring to hear from all of our panelists about the different routes you've taken to get to be where you are, right? So that, you know, the first step may not be, you know, your, your, your final place. It may not be where you really want to spend your time and you can continue to figure this out as you go. You know, your, your undergraduate educations, you know, especially speaking to our UVA students on the line are incredibly strong and will really serve you well. Um, so let me go back to our panelists here. So I have a few more questions and I'm going to open up to everybody else because I bet you all um, on the call do have questions for our panelists. I did want to hear a little bit more from Bill. Could you talk to us? You've had You've worked for the state of Virginia. Um, you've you've taught at different universities. You've worked at the Weldon Cooper Center and the Center for Econ and Policy Studies at UVA. Can you talk to us about those um, a little bit about what each of those org organizations do, and how you could bring your econ degree to that work? Sure, sure. Um, I work. Let me talk about my work with the state of Virginia. Uh, for a while because, you know, people often think when they want to go work for government, they're going to end up uh, at the federal government or even at international agencies. Uh, but there are lots and lots of opportunities for working uh, in state government. And I have students working in city governments as well and county governments. Um, when I work for the state of Virginia, uh, Virginia has a, um, an Office of Economic Analysis in the Department of Planning and Budget. And our job, uh, well, we had many jobs, but we did some forecasting because the state obviously needs plenty of forecasting. We needed to forecast the educational headcount. How many students are we going to have in various levels of education? How many prisoners are we going to have in our state prisons? Uh, how much are we going to be buying health care in our, in our Medicaid program and also the state's tax revenues? So we had a number of forecasting chores to do. Uh, but uh, another one of our main tasks was to work on improving the efficiency of regulations in the state. So all regulations in the state had to go through our office. Any time an agency proposed changing a state regulation or there was a new one coming from legislation, uh, we would have the responsibility of commenting on the regulation and asking, is it necessary? Is it well designed? Is it fair? Is it doing the job right? And uh, we would use our economics to evaluate the likely effects of the regulation on various people and on getting the job done. And uh, we would spend a lot of time, I, I, you can probably imagine that agencies didn't like to have to do this. They didn't like to have to submit their regulations to a bunch of economists and have us kibitzing on their, uh, on their responsibilities. But much of what we did, uh, many Virginia agencies don't have any economics expertise, and our job would really be to help bring uh, economics ideas into the design of regulations uh, in order to improve their performance. And so we would end up in long conversations with agencies, you know, why, are you, why have you chosen this idea for implementing the regulation, and had you thought about possibly doing it this way um, to improve the cost effectiveness or the outcomes and how do you plan to evaluate the outcomes of the regulations you're putting in place because we need to understand which ones are as effective as we expect which ones are not so um, I spent about a decade um, uh, as the manager of this economics group where we uh, evaluated state policies and then recommended improvements and the other task that we had was um, whenever the governor uh, uh, had uh, an economics question they needed uh, an answer for, they would call up our office. And of course, when the governor calls, you drop everything else and answer the governor's questions. So we would often be told, look, the governor needs a five page white paper on unemployment insurance three days ago. So get on it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we would turn back the clock three days and do the report for them and try to get it done as quickly as we could. Uh, so um, that 
that job uh, I really felt good about because over the years, uh, I think we were able to do a lot of good in improving the design of regulations that made them more efficient, made them work better, made them more fair. So it was a job where I felt like I was using my economics, again, as an engineer, uh, designing things and putting them in place uh, in a way that helps make a difference. And then I moved back. I had an offer to come back to UVA at the Weldon Cooper Center. And the Weldon Cooper Center is a public service institute affiliated with UVA. And our job is to help uh, advise state and local governments in how to um, uh, uh, improve the performance of governance. And so we spent a lot of time working on improving uh, state and local policies in Virginia. And uh, Fortunately for me, I have a chance to teach as well, and I, I teach in the Batten School, and I teach in the Economics Department, as some of you know, and um, uh, also I get to do um, some research as well. So one of the things I really like is to spend time uh, doing research on finding new ways to improve uh, environmental outcomes when we have environmental problems we need to solve. These days, of course, that means working in climate change because that's our big environmental problem these days. Um, and so I spend a good bit of my time trying to working with other academics to um, design new uh, feasible policies for helping solve the climate change problem. So it's kind of a, uh, you know, an, uh, an ac I was at academia for a while. I, I had an offer to come to the state and do really practical applied work for about a decade. And I did that, enjoyed that work, and now uh, have come back to a teaching and research position, which I love as well. Okay, great, thank you. We'll have you talk a little bit uh, later, or if you wanna just you know, share with us a little bit later, feel free to jump in. Maybe possible opportunities where students can do undergraduate research within any of those areas. But I, I wanna jump real quick to um, Elena. Can, can you talk with us a little bit about um, finding internships and jobs, what that was like for you on grounds, how you were, um, um, where, or after you know, being on grounds, how you made yourself competitive and, um, and any other thoughts that you may have in that area? Sure. Um, I think I had, I had a, a pretty difficult time um, straight out of undergrad. I think I was, I was confident in where I wanted to go, um, but it's scary to leave school. I think it's, it's particularly intimidating given the fact that, you know, it's pretty common practice within the comm school, for example, for, for, students to have offers pretty early on in their fourth year. Um, so the pressure starts to build and you start to tell yourself, okay, like it's my first job. I really will accept anything that I can get. So I did the whole, you know, sort of blasting probably hundreds of applications out um, to organizations that seemed to fit my profile, but I didn't know much about. Um, and I think, you know, that is and it's something that I promised myself I would never do again. It wasn't the right strategy. And even still, you know, I feel the creeping sort of pressure to, to engage in a similar strategy even now after having graduated from my, from my more recent degree. Um, because it's scary and it's scary to be unemployed and it starts to get very frustrating when, you know, you feel that you've accomplished this huge milestone in your life. Um, and then you, you're sort of in a, a limbo waiting period. Um, I think that, you know, there's probably a number of different ways that you could sort of approach this problem um, effectively. I think it helped me personally to, to sort of have a moment with myself and say, okay, like, I know exactly what it is that I want to do. Let's, let's cut out the additional sort of security blanket type applications that I'm only, that I'm only sending because I, I'd like to have something soon and focus all of the energy that I would otherwise be spending on, you know, superfluous additional applications on my target area. And once I sort of made that decision for myself, I started asking myself perhaps more difficult questions such as, you know, what is, what, what am I willing to do to sort of get into the sort of role that I would, I would like to be in? And, you know, for me, the answer was pretty much anything, including accepting a, a position doing IT help calls. Um, that would allow me to sort of get a foot in the door. Um, I think depending on the industry that you're interested in, you know, networking is 
not something that I love doing in terms of the way that I learned networking early on in my in my life, which was sort of these massive career fairs where you would sort of have two seconds with a recruiter and sort of have to explain your entire life story and be impressive within that space of time. Um, I think it's difficult. You know, I consider myself a bit of an introvert, definitely not the type of person who's able to shine in a room full of a thousand people. Um, but that's actually not, you know, the type of networking that I have found to be the most helpful um, in, in my career development. I think, you know, one-on-one -on -one coffees, the power of a cold email on LinkedIn continues to shock me to this day, you know, just reaching out to people that you admire within the industry, even if they're at the CEO or at the presidential level and saying, look, really admire what you've done in your career. I would love to get some tips and helpful advice from you. If you have, you know, 20 minutes for a Zoom coffee, that would be incredible. And those types of more, um, I don't know, they're more substantial relationships that you can develop. They, they are extremely helpful. Um, and then, you know, if, with, with respect to the IMF in particular, I think, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, Jennifer, the UVA degree is, is quite strong, especially within this area where it's sort of a household name. And so if you can, if you can get your foot in the door in that way, um, you're, you're going to be, at least you're going to have some sort of impact, whether that converts into a job or an internship, you know, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but those types of relationships you can build on throughout the rest of your career and they will, they will be helpful to you. Um, it's, it's a competitive um, company and I think, you know, there's lots of talk in the news about degree inflation. A, a lot of the, the RAs at the IMF do have master's degrees, but I think um, if you are able to, to reach out, um, I actually, you know, grabbed a coffee and I think it was my last year at the IMF. I knew that I was leaving. I'd been applying to, to graduate school for the past, you know, eight months or something like that. Um, got a cold email from someone who was also at UVA who had gotten my, my contact information through the ECO office. Um, and he was so impressive and fantastic. He had been, he had graduated, I think a couple years prior, had spent some time as an economic consultant. Um, and, you know, it was just, so fortuitous, the timing worked so well. I was able to arrange a chat with him and our um, our HR resourcing manager, and he ended up taking my position once I left the IMF. So these types of connections, they really help you. They're not gonna land you the job, but they are going to make sure that when your application is sitting there in a pile full of countless others, that you have at least the, the opportunity to, to have a face-to-face -face conversation. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do think whatever your feelings towards networking may be, um, it's, it's an extremely valuable tool and probably even more so today as we're, as we're moving to a more digital engagement type of world. I think that, that contact, that face-to-face -face type of engagement, um, it's really difficult to put a price on that. Um, it, it, it makes you stand out. It makes you um, noticeable. So. Yeah, I, I, I don't know um, that I would wholeheartedly recommend sort of going through the application process without, um, without doing that type of extra work, because I think it's going to put you in the most advantageous position to, to convert that application into some sort of position later on. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks so much for speaking so candidly with us, Elaine. I appreciate that. Um, Rushi, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to move a little bit more into Urban Institute and ask that you, can you tell us a little bit about Urban Institute and opportunities that, well, your, the work that you did and how you entered there and what opportunities there might be for um, interns and undergrads coming in? Yeah, that's a great question. So I entered into the Urban Institute based on my previous experience in marketing and analytics. Um, the marketing and analytics team actually sits on a, a larger communications team that consists of like external affairs, um, design, um, and basically like all of the all of the stakeholders that are responsible for getting Urban's research and message out there. So the Urban Institute is a social and economic research organization. Um, and 
we focus on a ton of different areas of research, um, most prominently in healthcare and the economy and social justice and education, and the list goes on. And the main message of the Urban Institute is something very broad, a very general blanket statement that I think is still incredibly impactful, especially with what's going on right now, which is improving people's lives and communities for the better. And so I think one of the most noticeable things that you'll see when you go on urban.org is that the website is full of data, full of statistics and visualizations. And the teams at the Urban Institute that are responsible for driving that research is multifaceted. They come from a wide range of backgrounds. And I will say that research analysts are highly valued and they're looked to upon in terms of ownership of the project that they're doing or the team that they're on. So at the Urban Institute, um, research analysts can have master's degrees for the most part, I think most of them um, come out of undergrad. Um, those are analysts and then um, you, I think the promotion schedule is that you'll be an analyst and then you'll become an associate. So I would say that if you're looking at opportunities within research and you're looking at a particular area of research, having done that um, Search and having done that introspection and reaching out to a particular organization such as the Urban Institute with the end goal in mind that you want to participate in this project or you saw that there's some visualization that you love to learn more about is the way to go. So the more organized, the more well thought out your statements are when it comes to reaching out to the HR department or someone at the organization, the more that you'll get noticed. And I'm happy to connect with anyone on LinkedIn. I'm happy to um, chat. You can send me a message. You can send me an email. I'm sure Chloe can share my Darden email. Um, it's changed a little bit, but I still have my uva.edu email as well um, so that we can continue the conversation going forward. Okay, great. Thank you. Incredibly helpful. Um, staying along the same theme there of organizations uh, someone could work for, what those roles would be. Bill, can you talk a little bit about, um, I know you've been involved with the Research Institute RFF, also the Weldon Cooper Center. What are some roles that um, our students on the line might consider applying for and how could they be ready? Oh. <laughs> um. When you finish up, or even before you finish up, when you're looking for a, uh, an internship, it you know it sort of depends on where you see yourself going, um, and and the other panelists have have <laughs> clearly um, you know laid out this um, challenge you have in in choosing a path and and then trying something and then moving on. Uh, I certainly have done that myself. Um, but there are, there are different kinds of jobs out there. Some are more research, or research oriented that are sort of you're grooming yourself to going on into a more research, research oriented position and other positions are more action oriented. You know, I will be involved in implementing and administering uh, programs. And so, uh, and, and and a lot of them are going to involve sort of basic gathering of information at first and then building uh, building arguments and conclusions based on your research. And so I think you just have to look, A, you, you look at topics you're interested in, B, you look at the kind of work you might like to be doing. Do I want to be actively engaged with people a lot or uh, as <laughs> Elena said, a little more introspective, I prefer to be on a little more research side of things rather than being out there talking to people all the time. And so, you know, it's the kind of thing you look for in, in what you're doing here when you're at the university. You know, am I more inclined to the the research side of things or am I more inclined to the action side of things and uh, some positions uh, bridge those and I think um, you know I'm trying to think back on not just my own experience but I've sent 
students on to many sort of um, many internships all around, all across the planet, really. Um, and um, I think a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of it just sort of depends on, on your own focus and pick something that where the, the work matches the, the type of thing you see yourself doing. I'm, I'm one of those introspective types. I like to be, uh, even though in my management positions that I've had, I'm not able to uh, stay in my, my nice quiet room doing my research. Uh, uh, often I like to have some time to do that. And so I think really it's just, um, well, let me just step back and say, um, uh, the, there are opportunities at every, every level and uh, you know, if you if you want to work in uh, a specific topic, of course, there are lots and lots of NGOs out there. Um, I have specific connections to uh, a number of them. Like Resources for the Future is an environmental think tank, and so you go work there. You're doing research. You're either modeling or gathering data, or um, and it, and it's very much the research-oriented job. And the people who get jobs there as interns usually are students who want to go on to graduate school. And so you have to sort of look what are what is this position grooming people for? In fact, I have a great story about my own son, who uh, was an economics major, not at UVA, but one of our fine sister universities um, in Virginia. And he um, really didn't know what he wanted to do, but he landed a job at the Federal Reserve, the Board of Governors at the Federal Reserve in uh, Washington, which is sort of a primo job uh, right out of, with a bachelor's degree in economics. Uh, but not very long after he got there, he realized that he was in the finance section there. And not long after he got there, he realized that Finance was not really his interest. He was spending all his time reading uh, deep into uh, firm financial statements. And uh, so it didn't take him long to realize that um, this was really not his, uh, his favorite role. And so he actually ended his internship early and moved on to other stuff. And now he's doing something completely different. Um, but it took, it took that try at this really interesting research job, tried that for a while and then moved on. And I think that reflects the experience that the other panelists have had, both Rushi and Elena have tried something, um, uh, learned from that experience and moved on. And I think whatever you do, uh, that has to be your strategy. Get out there and try something interesting because nothing you're gonna do right after your bachelor's degree is permanent. It's gonna set you up for something and then you're gonna, um, learn about your own skills and interests and learn about people in the area of your skills and interests and move on. And I think that's going to be a pattern that probably all of you are going to repeat um, after you finish up here. Very encouraging. Thank you, Bill. Um, so this is my last question. It's for Elena. In the meantime, if people want to start sending their um, questions through the chat, that would be great. Elena, could you talk with us a little bit about the um, IMF RAP, pro RAP uh, the research um, um, assistant program, and then one project that you worked on? Yes, definitely. And um, just to capitalize on, on what Bill mentioned and sort of tie it back to Rishi's experience, I think whether you're talking about um, sort of the area of interest that you're in. So, you know, moving around in between fields or even once you sort of know what field you wanna be in, where your, your happy place role is within that field. I think in and of itself, this, this ability to pivot and sort of explore new areas is it's a never ending sort of project that you will be working on throughout your career. And it's, it's great, it, it can feel nerve wracking. Um, know, Bill's son, you know, realizing that this is really not the place that he wanted to be. Um, side note, Bill, if your son wants to get me a job at the Fed, that would be great. Um, but, you know, I think even even now, um, as I'm looking to, to move on to the next stage, I'm, I'm thinking about, okay, what are the areas that I haven't had quite as much experience in that I could improve upon? So things like project management, um, 
sort of taking a little bit more of a writing role. It's been ages since I've drafted anything other than sort of like annexes and, and methodological text um, that doesn't really tell much of a story usually. Um, but that's, that's I, I agree, it's, it's a common thread for everybody that I've, I've spoken to about their career development and it, it should and can be a fun and, um, you know, a learning experience rather than something that should be inducing a lot of stress. Um, so the RAP program at the IMF is incredible um, for a number of reasons. It is certainly a stepping stone type of position. Um, RAs at the IMF are contractual workers and you're, you're capped at, I think, it's four and a half years now. Um, so it, it is a position that people typically, you know, they take knowing that they're going to be kicked out in a little bit. You can't come back and work there for another two to three years after you leave. Um, and for that reason, it is it is very much a stepping stone, usually to a next um, degree level. Um, people who are looking to go do additional schooling, um, or just for people who are interested in trying this out, um, knowing that it's not going to give you a lot of job security within the organization afterwards. That being said, it's um, it's a very interesting program. I was not actually within the RAP program as such. That program is incredible because it allows you to essentially rotate through a number of departments for a set period of time within the IMF. Um, so you might be in an area department as I was, which is geographically focused and you're working on individual countries, or you might be in a functional department um, such as finance, or they have a um, strategy and policy review, which is much more sort of political leanings, thinking about all of the different relationships between um, the country members and, and what that means for their various economic programs. Um, or even, you know, in something like HR, it allows you to sort of get a lot of exposure to different aspects of the fund's work. And for that reason, I think it's, it's a really incredible sort of right out of graduation program because it allows you to to have all of that different experience in a pretty short period of time. Um, some of the work that I was I was engaged in when I was um, an RA within the European department, and I think my day-to-day -day activities, um, and this is true of most area department RAs, it's primarily managing the flow of data that we get from the country authorities and then sort of working to standardize and clean that data so that we can compare all of the country's data in, in a sound way. Um, so, you know, I was working in Eastern Europe and for a country like Romania, for example, that, that often meant, you know, scraping PDF reports off of, you know, treasury, what, you know, not very glamorous work necessarily, um, but then for some of our other sort of more high profile program countries like Ukraine maybe, um, you, you, you might definitely get to, to work on some interesting models. Um, we've got these massive files that essentially um, connect all of the various economic sectors. And once you sort of get your feet wet with, with the data processing, you can start to work on building up some of those models, making different scenarios, um, trying to test out what might happen um, if oil prices fall or um, if they receive, you know, um, higher number than expected of, of migrants, what is that gonna do to the BOP um, and, and questions like that. Um, so that's your day-to-day -day work, that's all you're required to do. It's, it's fun, it's very dynamic, and it um, definitely allows you to build up a lot of very diverse skill sets. And then above and beyond that, there's a lot of you know, associations and organizations within the IMF. Um, there I was helping with a women in IT initiative, we had a panel, um, discussion and, and meeting, um, there's incredible opportunities for learning and training. I think that's probably the biggest um, benefit to working at a large established organization. There's of course downsides to that. It's like a lot more bureaucracy. Um, you might find that your ability to negotiate your position or your salary is a lot more restricted by rules and regulations, but there are such incredible resources available to you um, to, to get as much training and, and skill building as you want. Um, and then finally, yeah, the, the research opportunities are, um, you know, very sought after. There's lots of papers that are written within the department that sort of bring together all of the different team members that might not necessarily get the chance to work um, together on their country work, but then you start asking these big overarching um, questions um, and, and writing papers about those and, you um, that was probably my favorite aspect of working at the IMF was the opportunity to sort of just insinuate myself onto one of these teams, get to work with all of these brilliant economists, 
half the time I was, you know, completely intimidated, had no idea what they were talking about, but the ability to sort of, you know, um, make yourself responsible for something that maybe you don't have the most experience in and then have some of the most brilliant minds there to sort of guide you through step by step what needs to be done um, and how to how to be helpful as a as an RA on on those research teams. I think that, was there any other part of your, your question, Jennifer? Oh, no, that's it. I wanted to take us through opportunities and you know what day in the life is like. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. So we're going to use with the rest of our time here, we're going to allow our students to um, turn on your screens and your mics if you have a question. Please definitely turn on your screens anyway, uh, if you would. And then if you have a question, go ahead and unmute yourself um, and jump right in. Please introduce yourself, say your name, your year, if you have a major, what it is, and then your question. You can also send through the chat if you'd prefer. Okay, well, I certainly have some more questions that I can throw out, but I'm just going to wait another few seconds, see if anybody has anything they'd like to follow up with. Great to see you all. Okay, so for, I want to talk a little bit about technical skills. What technical skills our students could be building while they are here if they were going to enter, let's say, an RA program at the IMF, if that was their goal, if they were interested in a communications or digital role, let's say, at a policy organization, Rushi, and then uh, build um, uh, more research, or if they're interested in going into the public sector, what are the skills that our students could be working to build up now? Um, any of the three of you, feel free to jump in. Well, I'm unmuted. I'll just go right ahead. Right. Um, I'm going to maybe surprise you uh, by my first pick. Um, I think among the most scarce and valuable resources uh, in uh, the kind of technical fields where we serve is really good writing skills. The ability to develop an effective and interesting narrative around a technical topic that you are working on. Uh, when I am hiring, uh, I find that finding really good communication skills is uh, one of my great challenges as someone hiring a new person. Uh, I do not have the time or ability to rewrite everything everyone writes for me. And the ability to take the technical information that you have access to and are learning and are managing and build a brief memo that effectively communicates that information is a scarce talent. And as economists, you know that the scarcer the talent, the more valuable it is. Thank you, Bill. Rushi, Elena? Uh, I can go next. Um, I think that uh, if you were going to research and I would say uh, Professor Shope's point is incredibly important. Having, being able to understand complex issues and being able to simplify in a concise manner so that, you're, you, so that your learnings are impactful or the message is impactful is incredibly important. Um, I think that in terms of technical skills, besides that, I would say that having a baseline and understanding of statistics, uh, I think we did, I think I did Stata in undergrad through yep. econometrics and R would be, would be a really helpful um, a way of sort of getting on board with what uh, researchers are using on the day to day. And, and back in my day, when I graduated in 2015, there weren't as many resources out there, but nowadays, um, I think you can really be able to capitalize on some of those online courses to build up your skills in addition to um, classes. And um, at the core, everybody should be watching CS50, <laughs> like the first three classes of CS50 and understanding how coding works. Because I think no matter how relevant or irrelevant it is in your industry, the world is going in a way that if we're not seeing it already, 
um, which we are, it's going in a way that's going to be more and more technical. It's going to be more and more digital, um, in my opinion, and understanding um, sort of how code works, a baseline, very basic understanding, um, I think is going to serve you well. Thank you. Terrific. Great advice. Nalina? Sure. So I'll just give another thumbs up to both the, the writing skills um, and, you know, more technical um, programs and platforms. I think a caveat to, to the programs and platforms is like, I think it's rare that your Stata and R are probably as close as you're going to get to sort of a generally applicable programmer environment. Um, and even within those, I think that those are much more usual, like utilized within the sort of um, pure econ world. And as soon as you get out into something a little bit more nebulous, maybe policy consulting or um, impact management or measurement or anything of that sort, then you, you might get something a little different, maybe Python. And so I think as Rishi said, like even just having that sort of core base understanding, I wouldn't say it's something that you need to be worried about becoming a master in, um, because there's always the there's always the chance that you're gonna you're gonna end up somewhere where they use a completely different program or a completely different environment. I know that there's some there's some economists that really have strong feelings about one or another, and as an RA, you have to sort of just cater to whatever they're interested in. So I had to teach myself eViews, which is kind of considered an outdated platform these days, but some people love it. Um, so yeah, I think don't don't let it intimidate you if you've never taken a programming or a coding class. It's it's not the most difficult thing in the world to just get yourself up to a base enough level of understanding that you can then be confident that whenever you you do get a job and they have a program that you need to know, you're going to be able to get yourself up to speed very quickly. Um, it's it's not something that should scare people. Um, and the only other thing that I think I would add to to the list is. I think, you know, despite all of the incredible group work that we have, um, you know, you can come out of school and have all of the amazing, you know, well-known and established skills um, that you that you have, but unless you're able to, to position yourself well and comfortably within a hierarchical team um, and, and communicate effectively with all of the people above and below you, um, then you're going to struggle no matter what industry you're in. So just making sure that you're always humble with yourself because this is something that other people go into as a major, like just learning about effective ways to communicate and sort of manage um, the flow of work between competing priorities and, and um, doing that in a way that allows you to keep your sanity. It's not as easy as I think I personally thought that it would be um, after having done all of the hard work on stats and programming. It's like, oh, I don't know how to tell somebody firmly above me by three levels that no, actually I can't do this work right now and I can get it back to you by the end of the week. <laughs> but if you have any problems, please speak with my other boss who's demanding my work now. Um, it's, it's, it's a tough, soft skill to have. <laughs> oh my gosh, I think we continue to learn that throughout our careers for sure. Um, thank you for your, your comments there, everybody. Um, We've learned a lot. I'd love to hear from our students through the chat. Can you just post one thing that you learned that you're walking away from today in the chat? Just one thing. Usually I play the two in one game, but we can't, we don't have time for two in one. It's two things you've learned and one thing that you're going to do uh, that you can walk away with and, and do this weekend. But just one thing that you picked up today from the conversation. And as you're doing that, I want to thank our guests so much for joining us, sharing your knowledge your, and your experience. Um, we really have learned a lot um, about opportunities in public policy um, across sector, across job function. Um, so R Rushi and Elena and Bill, thank you for being here. Um, our students who want to um, if, uh, stay on the line, if you're interested in uh, office hours, please stay on the line. And everyone, you can check out Coursera. If you haven't already checked out Coursera, free to all of our UVA students till December 31st, our Coursera skill building programs. You could learn Python, you could learn R, you could learn business writing, you can learn, um, can't learn Stata, I don't think, on Coursera. Um, but many of the um, technical skills we've talked about here today are free for you throughout the rest of the fall. Um, thank you so much for our panelists. It's been wonderful hosting you here today. We look forward to seeing you again in the future.